Thank you. Thanks, Krenna. Thanks, Barry. Uh, and thanks, Conrad, for praying into New Year's resolutions, which is something that I've been thinking about uh, quite a bit over December. Um, and, and I don't know, this thought crossed my mind. I wonder if Bible characters ever had New Year's resolutions. So I, I sent my passenger pigeon to Google's headquarters and I got this message back. This is what Adam's New Year's resolution is. Seems like everyone's all about high fiber. Me, I plan to eat less fruit next year. <laughs> Esau, hereby resolve to draft Fair Trade Act and enforce it. Hashtag say no to stew. <laughs> Haman, more hanging with the king in the new year. Hashtag isn't it ironic. Here's what David has to say. Done fighting lions and Philistines, taking a safer job, playing my harp for the king. Hashtag can't lose. <laughs> Hosea, I'll get her to love me yet. This is the year I can feel it. Mary, Joe and I want to finish our family tree project. Thanks to David, it means fewer branches. And Timothy, at Coach Paul, said to flee the desires of youth. Will do, but what about the desires of middle age? So as I said, I've given some thought to some New Year's resolutions over December. I haven't had a huge amount of time to reflect, but I always find that that December, January period is a time where you can slow down and you can kind of reflect on your life. You can reflect on your year and you, and you can maybe ask questions. What did, I, what did I do well this year? What didn't I do well this year? What, what could I do next year to improve things, to make my life uh, more successful? So maybe you're here this morning and you have some goals and ambitions, some resolutions that you've set for yourself. Maybe it's got to do with exercise. It's, I don't know, I'm going to get a gym contract this year or getting in, get into running or kite surfing. I don't know where you do that, but anyway, maybe it's a, it's a, a health thing, it's a, it's a diet thing, I'm going to cut out dairy, uh, maybe it's got to do with work, there's some sales goals that you want to reach, or projects that you want to finish, or maybe it's um, a relationship type goal, that you want to be less grumpy, spend more time at home, or maybe you just want to buy a dog, I don't know, but this is the time, isn't it, where we are into the new year, and it's an opportunity for us to try and put into practice some of the goals and ambitions that we've set for ourselves, ultimately because we want our lives to be successful. But I want you to imagine a scene with me this morning, and just a disclaimer, the way that I describe it, it, prob it probably didn't quite happen this way, but stick with me, you're gonna get the point, okay? But Jesus is sitting with his disciples around a table in a large upper room. There's food on the table, and it's right before Jesus is about to leave the earth. It's one of the last times that he's gonna get to spend with his guys. The, these guys have walked with Jesus for three years. They've, they've gone on trips. They've spent time in each other's homes. They've done ministry together. And, and I'm sure there's, a, there's, there's emotion in the room because the time is short. It's an intimate setting. Jesus wants to say some really important things to his guys. So just picture, for instance, Jesus saying to his guys around that table, you've been with me for three years, but soon I'm leaving you, and I wanna ask you one question, guys. If you could do one thing to resolve, or one, have one resolution to make your life more successful when I'm gone, what would it be? What would that one thing be that you would resolve to do in order to improve your life? A post my ascension resolution, if you like. Maybe the guys are looking at each other and Thomas speaks up. Now I resolve, Lord, to trust people more when you're gone. Maybe Matthew resolves to figure out how to use internet banking. Or maybe it's more serious and John says, no, Lord, I, I resolve to be a better friend. And Peter opens up his mouth, I, I, I've got anger issues. I resolve to be less quick to get angry when you're gone. Do you think Jesus would agree that fulfilling these types of resolutions will make you successful, will make his disciples successful? Is that how he defines success? I think Jesus defines success completely differently. And in his mind, he had one thing 
that he was thinking about that would make his disciples successful. So to get his point across, he uses uh, an everyday illustration, that of a grapevine. He tells them that, that he is this grapevine and his followers, the disciples, are branches connected to this grapevine. And, and they would have understood what he was talking about because the grapevine was, it was a national symbol. I mean, it was on their coins and decorated the gates of the temple. Now picture him saying to his guys, those resolutions, those goals are not bad things, but they have nothing to do with you being successful. There is only one thing that you need to be successful in life. Only one thing that you should aim for to be successful when I'm gone. And then he tells them these words in verse four, the key to being successful. Remain in me. Remain in me. Okay, Lord, so we get the vine and the branches thing, but what do you mean by remain in me? What, is, what does that look like? What is that, what is that practically? And Jesus points out two things to them and to us this morning to help us understand what it means to remain in him. The first one is to remain in relationship with him. That's what it means to remain in him. Look at verse seven. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Jesus is emphasizing in this verse his words remaining in his followers, sinking in. But also, there's an aspect in this verse of prayer. There's an assumption that not only will the words of Jesus remain in his followers, but his followers will allow their words to come out to him. Jesus' words in us, our words to him equals relationship. Maybe his disciples are thinking, okay, so to keep relationship with you uh, is to remember everything you told us, Lord. So, so we, remember, we remember walking down the road and you taught us that, or when we were on that mountain and you taught us that. We're gonna remember. We're gonna remember the things you told us. We may even write them down. And it also means that when you're gone, we need to be in prayer to you. So we'll do that. We, we, we'll pray to you. We might even start a church and attend regularly. Lord, you don't need to worry about us remaining in you. We're gonna be good Christians. Don't worry about that. And Jesus is like, well, I know that you're Christians. Look what he says in verse three. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. You're already saved. But I'm talking about something that is far deeper. Verse nine. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. To remain in Jesus is far more than just his disciples reading a Bible, praying, going to church, doing their Christian duties. To remain in Jesus is to remain in his love, in a loving, intimate relationship. We get some of Jesus' heart again in verse 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus has invited his followers into a friendship, a beautiful, intimate friendship. Jesus is saying, when I say remain in me, I am after intimacy. I am after intimate union, oneness. Just as I am one with my Father, his heart is mine, his thoughts are mine, his will is mine. That's what I want for my followers, that you would be one with me, that you would share my thoughts and my heart and my will, that you'd love the things that I love, that there'd be an intimate friendship, that the DNA, the sap that flows through me, the vine, would flow through you. 
So to us, we may have some great ambitions this year, some great resolutions, some things that might improve our lives, but Jesus would say to us this morning that success is ultimately not defined by those resolutions and our ability to keep them. Success in his eyes is to remain in him. Most of you here this morning are already Christians. But it goes beyond your Christian duties. It goes beyond your Bible study. It goes beyond a prayer here and there, regular church attendance. You can do those things and not remain in him. Jesus is after something more. Jesus is after oneness with you and I. Jesus is after intimacy. He wants you to pursue him with everything you have, to love him, to make him your highest goal. So in 2020, let me ask us, are we gonna settle for a mediocre Christian relationship this year? Like we, just, we just go through the motions. Or are we going to decide to wholeheartedly pursue the king of the universe, the savior of the world, the lover of our souls, Jesus, with, with everything we have, with all passion? Are we gonna make radical decisions if we need to, to seek him, to love him, to pursue him, to obey him? Is this gonna be a year where we're gonna coast or where we're gonna give our all? for Jesus in pursuit of him. Remaining in Jesus may mean something different to you, but as I've thought about this concept in my own life, I've realized that for me, it's more than just the morning quiet time. See, I've been convicted about how aware I am of Jesus throughout my day. I have done a morning devotion or quiet time, whatever you wanna call it, for years. It's been you know, different over different seasons. It's always involved some kind of time of prayer, maybe some silence and solitude, maybe, maybe a, a time where I'm studying the word of God or where I'm meditating on a psalm or I'm listening to a worship song or journaling. But you know what's embarrassing? Is there have been many, many days where once I've closed that journal or closed my Bible, I've gone on with my day, I've gone to work, I've sat in meetings, I've engaged with people, I've done the work of ministry, come home, spend time with my family, we're sitting at the dinner table, we pray, it's the first time in the day that I have thought about God or prayed to him. Is that what Jesus meant when he said, relationship, remain in me? I don't think so. I remember reading a little book a few years ago. It really impacted me. Maybe you've read it. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's a classic by a monk, Brother Lawrence. And essentially what Brother Lawrence did is he learned how to walk with God through his day, in his daily tasks, to be aware of God. And I get that it's a different time and a different context. And like, yeah, but we live in busy Joburg. I get that. But the principle is what counts here. Imagine it was possible for me to walk with my God throughout the day, to keep in step with the Spirit, to be aware of Him, to be one with Him. When I'm triggered by something and I feel anxious or I feel angry, instead of just internalizing and bottling, to, to process with my Father as I go. As I'm in meetings, as I'm doing prep, I'm aware of God. Maybe I'm walking down the corridors and there's a verse that I'm meditating on. That's just the back of my mind. I long for this in my own life. I don't wanna settle for just a, a sacred secular divide. I've got my sacred time with God in the morning and then I live my life. I want oneness. I wanna walk with Jesus. That's what it means for me to remain in him. I don't know what it means for you, but imagine that was our goal to walk with God. Maybe there's certain things you need to cut out of your life this year or add to your life to pursue intimacy with Jesus. 
The second thing that Jesus tells his disciples when he's trying to unpack this concept of remaining in him is to remain through obedience. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. It's almost as though Jesus is saying to his disciples, there's a second reason why I'm emphasizing this word remain. And that's because no matter how good your intentions are, you are prone to not remaining. There is something inside each of you that will do everything in its power to keep you from being intimate with me. It will try and detach you. It will try and tell you that it's okay just to have a mediocre relationship with me. It's almost like this analogy. There's this poisonous plant, this weed. It's so poisonous that the branches that are attached to this weed are starting to be affected by the very poison that flows through them. The plant is destroying itself. But the father, the gardener, because of his great love and compassion, comes up to that weed and he cuts off those branches. And he takes those branches and he grafts them in to this beautiful, life-giving grapevine. And the life of the vine begins to flow through these branches. But unfortunately, although these branches are still a part of this vine, they are still remnants of that poison that live inside of them that still affects these branches. It's called sin. And this sin tries to do everything in its power to keep these branches from being one with the vine. It's doing everything in its power to detach them, to make these branches believe that life is found apart from the vine. And Jesus is saying the poison, the sin, needs to be ruthlessly dealt with or it's going to corrupt you. It's going to put a wedge between us. You need to remain connected to me. You cannot give this poison, this sin, a foothold in your life. Do what it takes to get rid of it. And yes, you remain in me as you remain in my word and my words remain in you. You remain in me through prayer. But unless you're going to actively obey me, sin will creep in. You have to decide to fight against this poison. The reason we internalize the words of God, where we learn what his commandments are, the reason we internalize them is so that they can be externalized in our life. So they can flow out of us and change the way we live. Doesn't James say, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves? Do what it says. We cannot be okay with just reading our Bibles. We need to be active in obeying what God's word says. We won't remain in Jesus this year, my friends, if we're okay with the presence of sin in our lives. And it'll be there, the side of heaven. It's always gonna be there. But if we're just gonna allow it to influence us and impact us, and we're not gonna make radical decisions against it, we're not gonna be intimate with Jesus. Part of pursuing Jesus is to allow the Spirit of God, and he made it this morning, to search your own heart, to put his finger on things in your lives that are not pleasing to him. He may put his finger on things like this. Look at what Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 19 to 21. The acts or the fruit of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. Does any of this stuff exist in your life? Put it to death. 
Do not allow it to put a wedge between you and Jesus. Now we know that although Paul's quite specific in this list, Jesus sums up all of the law when he says what? You are to love God and love people. That's what it boils down to. And he, he focuses in, he hones in on the second command to love others. Look at verse 12 and 13. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. How well are you loving others? You know, we, we love doing online assessments. We love doing, I don't know, personality tests and strength finders and Myers-Briggs and maybe spiritual gifts tests. But I wanna challenge you this morning to do an assessment in the way that you love others. Find three people in your life who you love and who love you, who you trust, who know you intimately, and ask them, would you say that I'm loving people well? How could I love people better in my life? And listen to what they have to say. Remaining in relationship and remaining through obedience is critical to a successful life in 2020. But if we are not going to be serious about remaining in Jesus, and we're not gonna be serious about obeying him, there is a very scary verse that Jesus points to. Look at verse six. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown away into the fire and burned. Life goes by really quickly. And I would hate to stand before God one day when I wasn't really serious all my life about being one with Jesus, about really loving him and knowing him more, where I wasn't really serious about dealing with sin in my life, and I stand before him, and I realize that I was never really connected to him. Where he says to me, you know, you did many things in my name, but I never knew you. And he picks me up, and he throws me into the fire of hell because I was never connected to him. That terrifies me. God's word tells us to test ourselves to see whether we really are in him. Let's, just, let's not just settle for a mediocre connection. It's fine, I'm saved, it's, no, that's all I need. No, 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 let's, let's go deeper. Let's walk with Jesus. Let's pursue him. What's amazing is when we remain in Jesus, something happens, something grows in our lives. Have a look at verse five. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse eight, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is what is beautiful. When we remain in him, when we become so in tune, so one with the vine, you know what happens? We start to produce the fruit that the vine produces. We can't but produce fruit that the vine produces. What is this fruit? Well, I imagine the, the, the disciples asking Jesus, this question, maybe they, they begin to reflect on his life and they begin to realize, you know what, Jesus, actually there was no one else like you. We've never ever met anyone like you. We've never ever met anyone who's loved God more than what you have. We've never ever seen anyone love people more than you have. 
You gave your life to serve the downcast, the needy, the sick, the poor. You, you loved in a way that was just otherworldly. We've never ever seen anyone kinder and more gentle and more compassionate than you. Jesus wasn't successful in the world's eyes. He, he wasn't wealthy, he didn't hold some position. But there was fruit in his life that glorified his father and that radically changed the lives of those who tasted it. And this is what's beautiful is if we're gonna remain in Jesus this year, if we're gonna stay in the vine, our lives are going to produce fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And as this fruit grows, three things begin to happen. Firstly, others get to enjoy the fruit. Others will eat the fruit of our lives as they spend time with us, and maybe they'll say, I've never met anyone like this. This person is way more loving than anyone I know. There's something different about this person. They're constantly putting my needs before their own. And as we love people like that, we start to show them that the fruit that's coming out of us isn't us. It's the fruit of the vine. It's the fruit of Jesus. We point people to him. We show them we are his disciples. And as they encounter him, as they see him in our lives, their lives begin to be transformed. The second amazing thing about bearing fruit is that our Father is pleased, He's glorified. Look at verse eight. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Father begins to see in us the fruit of Jesus, the fruit He saw in Jesus' life, and He is well pleased as we make His name famous. And then thirdly, a result of fruit producing is that we are filled with joy. More joy than anything this world can give us. Look at verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And you and I will know that there is no greater joy in this life than to do the will of the Father, than to love him and to love others well. It just feels like life. But here's my confession time. I read a little verse in this passage and I sometimes get really discouraged. Look at verse two. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. There have been times in my life where I have read this verse and I have felt so discouraged. Because I've said to God, Lord, I look at my life and I don't see as much fruit as I want to. I'm not as fruitful as I should be by now. And you say you cut off every branch that's not bearing fruit. And then I start to even question whether I'm saved. Am I really grafted into this vine? But Lord, I, I know, I think back to that moment at university when I understood the gospel the beautiful gospel, I remember that the weight off my shoulders, the joy, the freedom. Lord, surely I'm in you. You know my heart, God. I want to want you. I want to love you well. I want to love others well. What am I supposed to do about the fact that there's not enough fruit in my life? And maybe that's you this morning. I get that we can read these words of Jesus and we can feel this weight of like bricks on us. It's like, oh my word, I can't live up to this. I can't remain in him. I can't produce fruit. What if he says to me one day, I never knew you. But in times where I have felt like this, God's spirit often has brought one little verse to me that has meant the world and that has affirmed me. And maybe it's for you this morning. Philippians 1 verse six, that I can be confident of this, that he who began a good work in me 
will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Who saves you? Who starts that work in your life? It's not me, it's not you. God, the gardener, cuts you off, rescues you from that life of sin, grafts you into Jesus. It's the work of God. And the beautiful thing about that is when God starts a work, he finishes it. And his goal is not just to cut you off, get you into the vine and leave you for the rest of your life, even if you don't produce fruit. No, he is committed, 100% committed to seeing the branches connected to Jesus bearing fruit that bring him glory and impact the world. I can rest. I can rest in knowing, Father, you began the work, you will finish it. And you will prune me. And he prunes us. He takes us through seasons. He takes us through wildernesses and rocky relationships and shattered dreams and lost opportunities and bumps in the road. He takes us through them. He uses life circumstances to do what? To prune. If you've got roses, you'll know. Pruning is essential. Prune. Get that sin that's in our lives cut off so that we can bear more fruit. And that's our Father's job. And He's good at it. And He will do it. I love this little verse in Psalm 103, verse 14. It says, God knows how we are formed, He remembers that we are dust. You know what that tells me? He knows I'm human. And he knows that I fall short. And he knows that I'm unable to love him as well as I want to, to produce the fruit I want to in my life, that I, I can't faithfully remain in him every day. I fall short. But this is the beautiful thing. I can come as I confess that, as I confess my brokenness and my need. And what happens? He's gentle, he's patient, his grace is enough, and he says, I know, and it's okay, I forgive you. Tomorrow's another day, but I'm at work behind the scenes producing fruit in your life. And that's what we can do this morning. We can go and we can confess the fact that maybe in 2019 we didn't remain in Jesus. Maybe this morning we've done things that haven't pleased him thought things, said things, but his grace is sufficient moment after moment. We can come and rest. So as I close, I, I wanna urge you, church, to join me this year. To join me in making Jesus the pursuit of my life. To love him well. I'm not gonna do it perfectly but to, to make my life successful, not by accomplishing a bunch of New Year's resolutions, but to say above all those things, even though, though they're good, my heart is gonna be to pursue Christ with everything in me. I'm gonna love him by his grace. But at the same time, as, as much as there's a responsibility on me to remain in him, to rest in his work, to know that striving can cease because he's got it. He's got my life. He's working this thing out. And if you're here this morning and you feel like, man, I don't feel like I'm connected to this vine at all. I feel like I'm still part of that weedy plant. This is a moment where you can come in confession to the Father. And his heart is gentle and he loves you and he's patient. And he sent his son for you to pay the price. And you in this moment can receive him. As you quieten yourself, as you own up to your stuff, and you choose to live a life for him and not for yourself anymore. His grace is enough. He will graft you in. But church, apart from him, Jesus says, we can do nothing. So in 2020, let's remain connected to the vine. I'm gonna ask us to close our eyes and I'm gonna pray in a moment, but before I do that, maybe we could just take just a few minutes, just to be silent, just to be still and to allow ourselves to think about what God may be saying to us and to resolve to remain in him this year.
Father in heaven, we acknowledge our need of you this morning. We are desperate for you. Life apart from you is empty. We can do nothing, Lord, without you. Some of us here know you, Lord. We've been rescued from that poisonous weed. But we want more. We want deeper. We want to be an intimate friend of yours. We want your heart, your mind, your will to be ours. We want to love you more than we love anything. By your grace, Lord, that's what we resolve to do this year, is to pursue you, to run hard after you. Thank you that your grace is enough that even when we fail to do that, you're patient and kind. We can come to you like a child to a father, be received. Thank you, Jesus, that you will produce fruit in our lives if we are in you, because you, you finish what you start. If we are here this morning and we don't know you, we are not connected to you, we feel far from you, disconnected, like we've turned to other things, like we're stuck in sin, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you come now and you cut branches off from that poisonous weed and you graft them into the vine. May they know love and peace and freedom and a weight off their shoulders like never before. And may they experience what it feels like to know you, to be in relationship with you. Father, I pray for those here this morning who are struggling in any way. I pray for those who feel discouraged and hopeless. Draw near God. There is no greater comfort than knowing that you are with us and no greater comforter than your spirit. I pray for those who are sick, God, that you, oh God, would do a work in their lives. We long for healing where there are those who are sick. We pray that you would do that, Father. But we pray, more importantly, Lord, that you would comfort and draw near. We pray for those who are lonely in this church. Oh God, may, they show them, may you show them that they have a friend in you, that you are close. Please, God, have mercy on us. We all have needs. We're all broken. We're all walking this thing called life one day at a time. I pray this year, God, that more than anything, we would sense your closeness and would feel your love and your presence. We love you. We worship you. We pray these things together as your church in Jesus' name. Amen.